Hello everyone and good evening and welcome to our uh, webinar this evening, our expert guest webinar, um, where we're going to be talking all about infection prevention through effective wound management. Um, so before I let Alison get started uh, with her presentation, I do want to go through a little bit of housekeeping um, tonight. So um, as I said, it's our expert webinar with, with Alison. So she's going to be talking to you for about 50 minutes, give or take, and we'll um, leave some time at the end for uh, questions and answers. Um, do join us in the chat and say hello. Let us know where you're from, where you're joining us from, and if it's as cold where you are as it is here with me. Um, and if you do have any questions, Questions. Uh, we do have a Q&A section. What you need to do is just hover your mouse or um, click at the bottom of your screen and you'll see a little Q&A box and, and pop all your questions in there. Um, if you pop them in the chat, then we do end up losing them in the conversation. So it is really important that you pop them in there. And um, in that Q&A session, you'll obviously be able to ask Alison questions, but you can also ask me questions. So if you've got anything uh, specific to maggots or, or anything to do with, um, you know, specific wounds or anything like that you can pop them in as well so let's um move over to um the topic for today and Alison as I said is going to be our, our presenter she is a tissue mobility nurse specialist and clinical manager and she works for NHS York and Mole Digital which is a very interesting role I do have to say after talking to her the other day um but today she's going to be um presenting for you all about um how to um we explore how and why infections may develop in wounds uh, we identify risk factors to infection occurring she'll look and discuss about hard to heal wounds and biofilm formation we'll have a detailed look at the role of cleansing and wound bed preparation in preventing and managing infection we'll look at the tools and best practice documents to aid in practice and hopefully by the end of it you'll understand why antimicrobial resistance is an issue in infection control and what we can do to support it um, but that's all from me I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and let Alison take over. Thank you uh, Vicky, hello everybody, it's lovely to be here with you this evening. As you can see I am at home and uh, as some of you are and you may be in different locations so please do bear with us, you know what sometimes technology and IT, um, I've done this a few times so hopefully we should be all right so I am going to now hopefully share my um, PowerPoint with you so I hope you can all see that okay. Um, and um, I'll just get to the beginning. There we go, slideshow, and from the beginning, and um, there we are. And uh, yeah, my screen will move along, which is fantastic. So, as I said, thank you so much for joining us this evening on this cold, cold snap. My goodness, what is happening? And and also, it's been a big day, obviously, in our nursing profession today. So, those of you who have been able to make it. Um, and thank you very much. And we, we are obviously supporting everybody um, through what's happening at the moment. So, yes, today we're going to be talking about, um, you know, infection, as uh, as Vicky said, and we looked at, you know, hopefully what you can have as some takeaways um, um, this evening. So, um, we, you know, we, we do uh, put the questions in the in, in the question um, box and also, you know, you can um, get involved throughout and you can, you know, um, put some chat in there and, and, and discussion and, you know, just just let us know kind of, you know, what's happening for you and where things are. Sometimes the chats will pop up and I, I can see them. I've already seen like some of you where, where you're working in and people from podiatry, also so student nurses there, which is, you know, absolutely fantastic. My background is predominantly working in the community services um, for over 20 years now I've been nursing and um, I worked largely in district nursing in a, a, a northern and inner city area and um, all, then I went into the specialism of tissue viability and kind of moved my way through in tissue viability teams. I've led pressure ulcer prevention teams and now have, um, a, 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 you know, I'm still involved in, in the NHS at York, but also um, education is largely um, what I'm, I'm doing these days. So let's just recap, kind of go, you go, you know, it's, it's always good to go kind of back to the beginning with, with, with wounds when we're talking about anything. And, um, you know, just look at the um, the wound healing process. Um, and for those of you who are students, this will be good because I was talking to some um, newly qualified students in York last week when we were doing some lower limb training and they said, oh, we haven't had 
really any or it was like an hour during the whole of their degree in university which you know is astounding to me shocking so this will be good for you um so yeah so we have our wound healing stages um, and and um, you know we, we have the hemostasis that occurs first so any break to the skin you know this will happen um and the body's natural response is to to clot we get that you know that clotting um, factor um, to try and, and you know stem the bleeding of the wound obviously if people are having uh, particular medications um, like warfarin for example then you know that might be a problem and that might be delayed but this is the usual you know timeline and then in the inflammatory stage is is what is what we see and the inflammatory stage stage is a bit like the um you know the, the the kind of we get the, the you know all through these stages if you think of it like the workmen coming into the house so the inflammation stage um you know they're kind of coming in and trying to do um sort everything out and, and clean things up because we've got a rush of white blood cells coming to the area um we've got you know and then that can um, um, form um, 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 things like slough um, with um, you know bacteria and things and we're going to look at that as we go along so we get the clean up mob that come in with the macrophages and the phagocytes I always think of them like the pac-men those of you are as old as me will remember pac-men that come along and they kind of eat up all those, uh, all those, you know, those um, dead cells and the, and the, you know, the things to, to try and and, and keep um, a, a, the, the the wound along a, a good trajectory, um, and that's normal. That's a normal process, but obviously things happen in the body to hinder that. So after the inflammation, and some wounds get stuck in the inflammatory process, and we'll look at why that happens as well. Then we get the proliferation stage. Um, so this is when then we get in the angiogenesis. We're getting that formation of the granulation tissue. We call it granulation because it looks granular. The capillary loops are forming and it looks bobbly and it's kind of that brick red colour. That's healthy. That's what that should look like. So that's the wound you know going on to healing so if it's a cavity wound it'll fill in with the granulation um and then the wound edges will start to form um, and, and start to heal so we get the epithelial cells from the edges that will start to contract from outwards inwards and they will start to leapfrog across that surface and then we get to the wound closure and when we've got to the wound closure um we get then the maturation phase or the remodel modeling um, stage you know, when we get the scar tissue and this that stage can take up to two years um, to, to have that full remodeling. So if you think of like, say, a brick wall um, that, you know, that has been damaged and it's got a, you know, a big hole in it. If we just filled that back up with cement, with weather and pollution and things, it would just wear away again. So it's a bit like that with a wound. It has to remodel of the, the muscle and the tissue, all that structure to make it back. And it's never at full 100% strength again. So when we're talking about pressure ulcers, um, that's really important because if somebody goes back to, you know, a position of seated for long periods or lying for long periods, on that particular area, wherever it is, the likelihood is that it's going to break down again. So the body is an amazing thing and it does go through this process, um, you know, but then there are plenty of factors um, that will, you know, um, delay um, the wound and it, you know, it can happen then at different stages for, for people. So we work on the principles of moist wound healing. So this is the dominant research findings that we've had over 50 years. Um, and we always say, don't we, when we're looking at, if we're writing an article or we're writing a, an assignment, we say, let's look at, um, uh, you know, research and, and things that are within the past sort of five years. We want, you know, new evidence. But things like this, they just stand the test of time. So we clinically accept this. It was George Winter's theory of moist wound healing, and that was from 1962. So they did a study, original study was with, with um, pig skin, because that's very similar to human skin. So they evaluated the effect of occlusion on wound healing. So it demonstrated when they occluded the wounds or they left the wounds open, um, that they actually healed faster. Those epithelial cells migrated across the wound surface 
faster than those that were exposed to the air. Now we all know, and we've all will have, have been with patients and, you know, my family say this, mom and dad, and, you know, oh, leave it open to the air, let it dry out. Well, you know, that, that will just form a scab. And then underneath there, you know, the scab then comes off and the wound's still there. It doesn't, um, you know, um, it doesn't heal in the, the same way as if we put a dressing on and we occlude it. So it enhances the natural autolytic debridement that the body is trying to do anyway. Um, it reduces that inflammatory stage of the response that we might be stuck in. It increases the leukocyte activity because we want all that good cellular activity to be processing. It reduces fibrosis um, and inhibits that bacterial growth. And that's what we're going to be talking largely about this evening is bacteria, bio burden, biofilms, infection, you know, and then the healing rates, you know, kickstart the healing rates. Um, and, you know, we, we can move people on that tra trajectory. And then that scar quality, because if we got a scar coming off, you know, and it's we, we're going to, you know, we're going to get more of a, 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 a scab there, a, a, a scar, um, you know, which might be there for some people for, for you know, for a long period or forever. And, um, you know, that aesthetically, that depending on where the body that is, that, that can be a problem um, for some people. So we need to do good wound assessment. Um, you know, that is the, the, the starting point. And um, do you all use, you know, a, a wound assessment framework? I guess times would be commonly known everywhere now. And it was advanced into timers, but we're going to look at, um, you know, times um, for, the, for the sake of this evening. And um, there are, in practice, you might have the times framework embedded into your documentation, whether that's electronic patient records, such as system one or Rio, um, or you may have it in a paper documentation form where your um, wound assessment is set out um, with times within it. And, you know, it's a good thing to have that, to do it. Every time you look at a wound, you know, even if you're not completing the full reassessment at that point or an initial assessment, then run through in your mind the times the tissue, infection, moisture, edges, surrounding skin. You know, keep that in your, in your mind, in your process, and it will really help you when you're observing wounds at every single contact, you know, to, to see if there's changes or if there's progression um, of, of the wound. Of course, on our initial wound assessments, we need to be completing this um, because, you know, it's, it, it's important to then form our initial um, care planning and, you know, and, and to help this, the, the patient um, for, in, their, in their wound um, healing um, process. So we have the tissue initially, and this is important, you know, this is all important when we're talking about the infection management. So we are assessing what that tissue type is. So is there dead or devitalized tissue or is it that brick red healthy granulation tissue, you know, that is nicely coming on? Is there a nice pink epithelial edge to the wound that we can see is starting to contract in? Because if the tissue is devitalized, then that is going to harbor the bacteria and that is going to hinder the wound healing. And we also need to consider whether there's biofilm present. There's so much more research and, and data that, and information we know now about biofilms. And I'll look at that in a little bit more detail as well. So we need to be considering all this just on that initial, what is that tissue doing? You know, and what then are we going to do to, uh, to, 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 to manage that? This is something I had in, um, 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 in one of my wound care formularies and, and often in our practice we will have, you will have a wound care formulary somewhere in your practice. If you don't know where it is then, you know, please do um, try and, um, and, and seek it out. And, and on there you'll have all these different wound products and, you know, I mean, I always say that the, in my last trust it was a bit like the Argos catalogue, you know, there was so much choice in there. Um, and I know the National Wound Care Strategy Programme now are doing a lot of work on a 
it's not a national formula, it's a categorization system of you know where particular products fit and what they do. So this was was like that. It was like so we've got all the different tissue types you can see on there, some good images, you know, and what are our objectives and, and primary dressing options? People often say to me in practice, people will ring me up and they'll go, What dressing should I use? A dressing doesn't heal a wound the body heals the wound what the dressing does it will aid the symptom management it will aid what we're trying to do with the you know infection prevention and control it will help with autolytic debridement so you know we have got a lot of really good options there and if we work with our industry partners so we can understand we can create pathways and you know things like this which will aid and standardize um, and practice um, out there um, and do you remember the days when we always used to say like with them um, like when it was at the, that grand look at that granulating tissue there you can see that brick red pitch that I was talking about you know we used to say oh you know um, just when it once it's like that just leave it alone don't do anything with it but that we know now that's not true you'll understand why when we're talking about biofilm that you know and what we need to do to um, you know to even when it's like this to you know to then stop it stalling and um, and getting bacteria and, uh, and and infection there so we're moving along with the times we've looked at tissue so infection and um, you know with infection we've got um, local infection is used to um, refer to a stage um, of infection and we'll look at the infection continuum in, in a moment on the next slide so the, it means that there's a presence and a proliferation of microorganisms and so within that wound then that revokes um, a response from the host from the person from the per, you know with, with the wound and so often then we've got a delay in the healing at this point so the local infection which is the covert signs that you can see on screen there is um is is you know might not be immediately um you know visible to us um we might not recognize it as a sign of of, of infection but we've got things there like um, hypergranulation so that over granulation it might be what we call friable so that granulation it bleeds really really easy to touch it's kind of almost too bright red if if you like so it's it's over granulated because there's bacterial and um, um, growth in there when i talked about epithelialization so contracting from the wound edges in you can get pocketing so in the middle of the wound you might see epithelialization happening so bridging and pocketing and that's not healthy um, so the wound's delayed as we don't would expect we've got more exudate occurring and what does that exudate look like you know is there some odor to that as well what's the color of it is it thick is it thin and also pain what's the patient telling us that oh this is you know it's throbbing now and you know there's just some there's change and we should always listen to um, to what our, our patients are telling us and then as that wound infection um, you know, in increases, then we get to what we call the overt um, and signs, so they're, that cl they're classic signs of wound infection, which, you know, you probably have seen and will recognise. Um, so we've got that erythema and we've got, you know, that, that redness, that inflammation um, to the to the wound, wound edges, and that might spread two centimetres beyond the edge of the wound. And sometimes we can see it tracking. And we have to be aware that in uh, people who have a dark skin tone, that that might present differently as not in um, erythema, as in, you know, a, a redness but in a kind of, of like a bluey or a purpley, but we have to touch, don't we? we have to feel, because we can feel if it's warm, it might be swollen, it might feel hard, it might feel spongy, um, you know, that purulent discharge, the wounds, you know, we, we're doing wound measurement. There's some great digital apps out there, aren't they? I know in York, they're doing a trial of one at the minute. I don't know if any of you are using those. Um, and uh, which you know will it kind of measures the the sizes the depths and things because you know if we all measure something I get I guess we would all maybe come up with a slightly different you know sizing but you know it is an important thing to see if if things are changing 
um, increasing pain again and that increase in malodor. You know, some, I was saying to somebody yesterday, I was talking to somebody else, who he's not a nurse, but I was trying to describe and they were, and I said they were, they, they could see images, but I said it's more about that. And sometimes, you know, you can, I know as a district nurse, sometimes you could open the letterbox, you know, and that if it's like that necrotic softening tissue, you can, you know, you you, you can really smell that, can't you? And, and coming through. So the M along the times is for moisture. So, you know, and it's like, it's a balancing act is moisture. Exudate, we need exudate, you know, it's a, it's a natural part of that process. Um, but, um, you know, we, we, we don't want too much of it because it will hinder um, the wound healing process. So if we've got a lot of it, like that image on there, that's a venous leg also, which are notoriously quite wet. We can see that macerated skin around the edge. So a high vol of volume of exudate can increase the bacterial levels, but then a low volume, if the wound's very dry, can indicate um, dehydration to the person as well. The colour of it, you know, if it's um, like a, a, a quite a, a, a greeny colour, sometimes almost bright green, that can be pseudomonas and, you know, that there is a, a particular odour to that. If you leave a, a damp dishcloth on the side for a few days, you know, and just leave it, it gets a slimy appearance on it and you can smell it. And that's that's often pseudomonas. And the viscosity of the, of the exudate as well. So the thicker it gets, the higher protein level, um, especially, in, you know, people with um, chronic edema and lymphedema, which they have that with the lymphatic um, um, issues they've got high protein level of the exudate there um, so but the high protein level can in, indicate in the infection and it will burn and um, and excoriate the skin um, surrounding too the wound edges um, are really important. So we, if we're assessing the edge of the wound can help us to understand whether it's progressing. So we've talked about the contracting. We know that the epithelial cells swimming or leapfrogging, whatever you, we know you want to term it um, across. But that overgranulation we mentioned at the edges, but also a rolled edge. You know, sometimes they kind of roll and they kind of go in and undermine a little bit. So if that's rolling like that, that those epithelial cells are just going to roll down. You know, they can't get across across the surface. Um, so it may be that we need, you know, if, if all these things are happening and we, we kind of can't manage them, do we need then a specialist uh, referral into our wound care or tissue viability services, you know, for some more advice and support in, you know, what do we do with that? See a lot of that with um, with that um, category three and four pressure ulcers where the edges tend to, to roll down and in. I used to have a great device in practice and it was a bit like something out of Star Trek where you could actually, um, you know, hold it to the wound, take a photograph, you know, how to do it kind of, there was a dark cloth cover in it um and um, and it would show up an image and the image was detecting bacteria which was lying there in the wound and it would come up in either like reds or greens depending on the type of bacteria that was there um and often it was the wound edges kind of that dry skin area um that you would find it there because we you know we might be doing our processes of cleansing etc but the edges might be missed so you know do be mindful um, of that so we've got the, um, and also with the edge, sorry, I didn't have, um, um, the surrounded skin. So when I'm saying wound edge, but then surrounded, surrounded skin. So if you've got a leg ulcer, for example, you know, it's, it, it, again, we've got hyperkeratosis, kind of that dry skin and things, then, you know, go beyond just the peri wound edge and go, you know, further on the skin. And that involves our, you know, um, um, skin hygiene um, processes there. So the factors that do affect the wound healing when that wound becomes stalls, and this, it, 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 you know, you can see them there. There are multiple and many of them. Um, so these are the uh, risks to delayed wound healing. So um, they can cause complications. And this is why that holistic assessment, remember, it's not just the hole in the patient, it's the whole of the patient, as we always say, 
that's why we do the holistic so it's it, we do the times which is about the wound but we do this alongside it really important in first assessment and then when we're doing our if there's any changes with the patient or we're doing our our reassessments so age obviously will affect because we have changes to our skin which you know the largest organ in our body changes occur with age we lose collagen and elasticity can become much more fragile Nutrition, I'd argue, is one of the most important parts of wound healing. You know, the um, micro and, uh, and uh, macro nutrients that we get from, from the diet, not to forget fluid as well, you know, um, uh, the added protein. If you've got a large exuding wound, you're going to lose a, a lot of protein through that. So without that additional support, whether that comes through diet or supplements, you know, that that wound is going to struggle to heal. Those underlying uh, conditions that people have, and there are multiple of them, the medications people take, it might be, you know, chemotherapy, um, steroids, um, in, um, many, many things that will, you know, can be a risk to delayed wound healing. The psychological status, um, mental um, health and, and well-being, the mental health of people um, and the, you know, people's quality of life. We must talk about that more, do quality of life assessments, because that can have an absolute direct effect on, on the wound healing. People don't sleep, they don't want to eat, you know, if they're not in, well in themselves. Um, pain, of course, the mobility, you know, all those activities of daily living. Remember that Roper, Logan and Tierney, that's what we had like, embedded when I trained to be a nurse. Um, and then right at the centre there, we've got that foreign body and um, all the bacteria. So all these things are like that bacteria is going, oh, we've got all these risk factors here. You know, yeah, great. We can, you know, we can we can do, march across that wound and we can do our, do our work. So we, you know, we need to. Um, try and, um, and and stop that so so this this is what you know that wound looks like we looked at that process of the wound healing so we've got a wound there that's got this slough in it you know you can tell can't we that's a devitalized wound and then we've got the middle one we've got that beautiful granulation tissue that nice edge and then we're going on to that maturation phase and the, and the closing you know so what do you see in practice what are the things that you see that are the you know that 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 can be um, a, ch a challenge it might be for you as a clinician, a time to complete, you know, a good assessment and full assessments. We know the challenges that are out there in practice right now. There might be too much extra date. How do we cope with that? How do we manage the pain for the patient? We talk a lot about adherence, you know, concordance. We need to get to the bottom of that. We need to kind of interview patients almost, motivational interviewing and things to find out why is somebody not wanting the treatment? Um, that we're advising is it a struggle to refer to specialist services we all know through covid a lot of things change and how hard um, things have become have you not got access to education because that was largely stopped has that started again you know can we get our products supply chain we've had, we know there has been a lot of issues you know what are the best options so there's many many things to uh, for us to, uh, to to contend with so making a wound hard to heal, you know, those are the things that, you know, we've talked about. Also, poor vascular supply, underlying etiological conditions, especially wounds of the, of the, of the lower limb as well. So there's some podiatrists on tonight. And um, so I, I put this picture on um, and, and uh, you know, this is a, a obviously classic diabetic foot wound. And, um, you know, people who have um, um, issues such as diabetes may have masked in infection. They may not show the classic signs. They may have neuropathy. So they've got reduced sensation and they might not be, be able to tell us that the pain that they're in. They've got reduced oxygenation. They may have things like Charcot foot, you know, nerve and muscle damage, um, hammer toes, um, you know, just that micro vessel disease so re reduced perfusion and, and people with um, rheumatoid arthritis I've, se I've seen that as well so to be mindful of that you know when we're thinking of infection you know and you know sometimes we may give antibiotic coverage to people who, who have you know um, uh, uncontrolled diabetes and, and have and, and present with wounds like this because we know you know and um, we have to act very fast 
um, and amputations, you know, are, you know, very, very, very high and can lead to, um, you know, um, injury and, uh, and, and, and death sometimes as well, can't they? So the bacterial colonization versus infection, what's that? So it's the type and uh, abundance of microorganisms in the wound. Um, and it depends on where the wound is, the depth, the uh, oxygen supply, the patient themselves, what's going on with them, all those things we looked at, and tissue perfusion. So contamination of the wound surface itself by microbes is the first step in the presence of the organisms of the wound. So at this stage, the manifestation of those bacteria within the wound, they might be transient, but then subsequently we get that colonization and proliferation occurring. Um, so, you know, we, we've got, so colonization is defined as multiple um, bacteria that are attached and, and, you know, and they are continuing to, to, to grow. Given that, you know, the right environment, they will, woof, they will just fly. Um, so if that becomes too great, the colonization, um, then, um, you know, we've got um, the, the virulence factors increase the effectiveness um, for infection. So we, we get, you know, just it, it just goes it goes out of control, to be quite honest, to put it bluntly. And then the, the, the patient's immune response might not be enough um, to to support um, in, you know, that in 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 that in combating in that inflammatory stage so then we get infection then we can get in systemic systemic infection so in the most extremes of cases that wound colonization can lead to potential of you know, serious harm from you know we just talked about diabetic foot from amputations you know and even death um, wounds such as burns for example I've seen category four pressure ulcers with patients who, which have led on to osteomyelitis and sometimes um, death um, uh, with that as well. So there's a, you know, it's like, how do we manage that? So there's a lot of evidence around, you know, of, of, of different ways of managing it, with which, you know, we, we are going to, to look at. So this is the, um, the um, wound infection continuum. And this is from the international um, best practice um, document, so it is available to um, to to all of us. So they they, they did change it because there was uh, critical colonization at one time, and and you'll see that now um, that has gone, and we've got the biofilm um, in there as well. So we use this is really good tool to have to use in clinical practice. All wounds are contaminated with microbes, you know, um, stop the press, that's nothing new. So we can see that we've got contamination at the bottom of the scale there. They love that moist, warm environment where they just stretch and grow, you know, across the wound bed, but also into the tissues, into the wounds um, as well. So if we get that optimization of wound management from the start, so we need to think in terms of prevention. Don't wait till that horse is bolted. We've got contamination. We've got colonization there. So it says vigilance required. We might not need antimicrobials that are donating, you know, particular things into the wound at this point. But we have non-medicated wound dressings, which, you know, maybe bacterial binding or kind of natural enzymes. There's lots of things we could still use at this stage if we wanted to, to aid in the autolysis. But then we can move on to local infection, that spreading infection, and then into systemic infection. So intervention is required at this point. So then we might need a different type of topical antimicrobial. And then if we have spreading infection, this is when we are talking about um, antimicrobial um, uh, and systemic type of antibiotics. So not earlier than that, you know, at spreading infection. So it's good idea to have a pathway with this in, and it's good to have red flags and look such as the lower limb document from the National Wound Care Strategy Programme has a really good um, page on red flags for the lower limb. So take a look at that if you've never seen it, because it will trigger that early warning um, um, for us. So we have a national early warning scores, don't we, that look at pulse, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and, and oxygen. So we, when we're going into the systemic issue there, so you know all those um, nursing observations that, that, that we know about. 
So the wound infection will occur, just to summarise, so when, when we've got that organism, you know, it's attached, it's virulent, it's out of control, the immune system of the patient might be compromised, we've got that devitalised tissue we've seen from doing our TIMES framework, um, and then, you know, what is that, um, the, the exudate, what is happening there, how are we managing everything which is, uh, which is going on? Just think of, in, in your mind, of some patients you know, who, um, who you might be concerned about um, and, uh, you know, that they, they're at risk or having infection at the moment. So the biofilms, what is the biofilm? So the myth is, we always used to say you could see the biofilm, it was like that slimy presence across the surface of the wound. But now we know, actually, in reality, a thin, slimy film on the wound surface um, it might be considered to be that. And, you know, in some cases it may be, but really the microbes are completely invisible. So, you know, if we can't see it, it's, it, you know, it doesn't mean that it's biofilm free. So, um, you know, in the, the and, and taken from the best practice uh, documents, you know, they tell us they've got these panels and working groups that put together saying that, you know, biofilm is, is present in all um, hard to uh, hard to heal wounds. You know, it is an obstacle um, to that. And if we think about um, oral health, you know, so um, you know, we we all brush our teeth every day, don't we? A majority of people do once a day, twice a day, sometimes more. We have all sorts of tools and gadgets these days to tackle the plaque, the dental plaque, and that is biofilm. When you wake up in the morning, you can kind of feel that film on your teeth. That is what that is. And we know from the from the, the dental world that it, it the, that reforms very, very quickly within 24 hours. So that's why we, we do the, you know, that we keep doing the brushing. Um, so it's on a cycle formation. And then people, you know, can get a mild form of kind of like gingivitis, like gum disease. But we know with, you know, that kind of if, we, if we're doing that, that preparation, we're doing that cleansing. And the, and the treatment that we do that then that that combats it. it it's I think we used to think of wounds as in like oh we gently kind of tend the garden but really it's a battlefield those biofilms they're like a force if like force field Poof. it's so hard to um to to penetrate into them and we have to do that we have to go in hard you know into the garden think of that of all these weeds and things get in there and try and get them and you know we need to we need to tackle them because they will just form and form and form and they will bury themselves down into that wound as well and if your if their patient has got immune response issues then you know that they, the biofilm can become tolerant to the antibiotics and the antiseptics so we can keep giving and giving these things you know and it's not going to be making um you know much much difference so we have to think of wound hygiene as we think of oral hygiene so it's a bit of a change of language but we need to you know sometimes change our thoughts and thinking of what we do to try and, and, and you know and uh, and make a difference so the infection there you know we've got we have to think of you know got a wound there you can see kind of some classic signs of in, infection there and you know what are wounds are they failing uh, with you know antibiotic treatment and we've all seen where um, you know, antibiotics have been prescribed and prescribed and surprised whether, you know, they don't need to be um, and, you know, kind of what, what's going on. So keep thinking times uh, framework um, in, in your mind. So there we have the teeth. I, I loved, I just found this picture and I thought I like quite like that. It's quite good, good for children, I think, as well. So you can see on that's the teeth on the tooth. We've got that, that biofilm um, a, a form in there and, the, you know, antibiotics, they're bouncing off. The immune system's not responding. We give it all a good cleanse, you know, and uh, and then we've got that shiny, uh, lovely tooth, um, you know. And the same goes with with our skin as well as an organ. We have to think of it in those in those terms. So wound bed preparation. Now this is a vital and essential part of what we are doing. So we can see there that's a pressure ulcer. It's a hundred percent slough, sloughy wound. Um, you know, that normal wound healing process, we've got autolysis in our body, but we need to help that along. Yes, moist wound healing. Yes, some of our dressing products can address this, 
but chronic or hard to heal wounds, and we tend to use the terminology now, hard to heal wounds, they're stuck in that inflammation um, phase. Um, so we've got a reduction in fibroblast, delayed autolysis, delayed healing. So we're just giving it that helping hand um, to, uh, to, to, to move along. So what is slough? Now, it's, this is important to note because some people think, oh, we can see slough on a wound and that's a sign of infection. Well, it's not necessarily, it can help to lead to that bacteria, the bacteria there for sure, and that bacterial growth, and then it can be, you know, it can get local or spreading infection then from that. But slough is, you know, it can be it's yellow, it's viscous, it's made up of the cellular debris from the inflammatory process. So white blood cells, bacteria, dead tissue. So, um, you know, what, what, so what's the problem with that? What, you know, what, what do you think about it? Well, it can mask a, a wound, count it a wound bed. So if we're categorizing pressure ulcers, that's the problem to us because it's unstageable, um, you know, and we, we, we can't see what's going on. And then we've got, you know, we, we can lead to, to infection. So we have to address the slough. And how do we do that? We're doing that through processes of, of wound bed preparation. So in our wound bed preparation, as I said before, wound hygiene is a really good term that's now been, been used out there. So we can align that wound bed to, to loosen that superficial devitalized tissue and to, you know, to get that through that, you know, false field of what the biofilm is, you know, in there with mechanics, really. So, you know, give it a good clean keep saying that i keep hearing this phrase of clean it like you mean it and we have to do that to remove that that biofilm that's there and all that periwinkle skin where the bacteria is uh, is lying so um yeah so so we're not going back to the days of oh it's granulating leave it alone because we'll disturb that granulation tissue we know now that's not true so you know we can use um there's there's so much research isn't there tap water versus saline um and for a, a hard to heal wound a post-surgical wound post 48 hours we can use tap water in majority of cases so you know um, you know, gauze or whatever from your, your dressing packs. Yes, there are surfactants, there are solutions and antiseptic um, washes and things. You know, they, they, I mean, when they first came out, it was a case of leave it on there, soak it on there for 15 minutes. And now that time's got to be an issue, there's a lot of messages of, oh, use it as a wash you know and you know is that is that the right thing but it, you know if you see things working then then that's that that's okay but tap water is fine for um for um chronic wounds so the debridement so cleansing and debridement is both part of wound bread preparation so um actual debridement is is essential you know there's different elements to debridement so what does that do so it's going to reveal the extent of the tissue damage because we can get rid of the slough and devitalized tissue so that will promote the epithelialization we're going to reduce the bacteria that's there disrupt the force field of the biofilm so that'll reduce odor which often if you speak to a patient about their aims and goals it might not be oh, we want the wound to heal, they might just want it to be less wet. They might want it to, to be have less odour because they feel shame and embarrassment about that. So always keep your patient at the centre and the heart and speak to them about what their you know, goals are. So ultimately, the debridement is optimising the wound healing potential. It's going to kick start. And we need to be cleansing the wounds Every time we see a wound, not just once every four to six weeks, like you know, when we used to do a re-evaluation, or we might do you know the paperwork of that. Every time we have a we change a dressing or come into a wound contact, we need to cleanse that wound because of remember the biofilm is just going to keep reforming, reforming, reforming. And when we're doing that and doing the debridement, then the products we are using are going to be more effective. So the methods of debridement are the autolysis. So that's where we will put a moist uh, a dressing on to create that moist wound genal environment. Um, we've got the, the larvae, the biological aspects. We'll talk a bit more about in, in a moment. We've got sharp debridement. And sharp debridement, you have to have the skills for it. I went on a specific course to do that as a tissue viability nurse. 
um, and um, you know that, that, that there's you know, issue, I guess, around funding and access to these types of courses. Those of you who work in podiatry, I imagine many of you will have those skills and, and qualifications to do that. So if you can't do it and it needs doing, then, um, you know, seek somebody out to do that. Um, there's things like hydro surgery. So you get these powerful water jets, you know, which will be done in a clinical environment people might go actually into theatre for surgery and um, to read for, um, for types of debridement um, and then mechanical which we can all do in practice because we might have things like monofilament pads we might have particular wipes and things or our gauze and our water you know giving that clean it like you mean it is going to help to disrupt the biofilm and help to remove some of that dead and devitalized tissue and if there's a, there's a heel wound there, which with some necrosis on it, you can see if it's something like that and you are, you know, in, in, um, we are looking at to debride, we need to know the etiology of that person um, and, uh, you know, what's going on with their lower limb and foot before we go in there to remove that, you know, because we need to know um, what a person's um, arterial, um, if they've got insufficiency or, or not, or potential to heal. So the, the lava therapy, and, you know, we are kindly sponsored this evening by Biomund, and, you know, it's great that they are uh, putting these educational sessions on, on for us, and we've had quite a series so far, but, you know, we are talking about infection management and wound bed preparation, so I really wanted to mention the, the lava therapy. And I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to go to the, the lava, I call it the lava factory in the, in the, there in Wales, which is, you know, it's, it's an amazing place when you go and, you know, to, and to do the tour and it, it's, it's just fantastic and it's fascinating, you know, and these little creatures are just amazing little surgeons. So what they do is they, they use the live larvae of the green bottle fly species to remove unviable tissue and bacteria from those non-healing uh, wounds some acute wounds but it tends to be chronic hard to heal wounds so the lava that's produced it's secre it has to create produces secretions people think that they have these little teeth that go in and kind of eat stuff up it, it's not like that it doesn't work like that so they produce these secretions that contain um, proteolytic enzymes which then they, they liquidize um, devitalized tissue. They're very selective about the tissue. It has to be the devitalized bit. So that then flows into like a liquid or semi liquid. Then they suck it up, they ingest it through the net of a, and so we can see there we've got that bio bag. So they often come in in the bag, they're inside the bag. You can get free range ones as well, but say if they're in the bag, they'll do that through, through, the, through the net. Um, of, of the bag so then they perform microsurgery and said little surgeons they have these mandibles from their you know on their kind of what you call like a mouth area so that scores and then loosens the tissue um, and then they so they physically can select the bits that they want to remove that unviable bacteria um, so it's a it's debridement it's gentle it's very precise um, and and then what they do is they, they have these hooks and rough bodies, so that kind of loosens and scratches the, the, the say, necrotic tissue, um, for example. Um, but then with their digestive process, which this is, is just fantastic what they do, they secrete these, these uh, digestive enzymes um, and then they have the ingestion, but then they secrete properties which degrade, you know, de degrade that down. And also with that, that's found to have, because there's, there's studies in Wales being done on how exactly this works. So that secretion has been found to enhance plasmin formation um, and also to in induce um, fibrinolysis. So that keeps the wounds free from the infection and reduces excessive inflammation. So, you know, it is absolutely fascinating. There are barriers to using it, and there was a study done, and it's in the Nursing Times actually. There was 160 nurses interviewed saying, "Why don't you know why? Why would they not be, or don't use larvae?" And this is what they said: it was either a lack, lack of knowledge or training around it. They felt they would, didn't know enough and uh, how to use it. And it actually is quite very straightforward to use. I've used it in community and patients' own homes before. It's fine. 
they might not have a protocol or pathway around debridement per se, you know, um, and, but also including this. Prescribing might be a problem or procurement. Um, I've heard GP say before, oh, it's too expensive, but, you know, actually when you look at then across the trajectory of a wound, the expense goes out the window because, you know, a, a non-healing wound, believe me, is extremely expensive. And the majority of the time is you going to, to do the wound management. The patient perception, which is the yuck factor, but also we get the yuck factor in the clinician perception as well. I've heard people say, oh, God, I just can't, you know, I, I, I can't use it. But we have to get beyond that because we've just looked at what amazing you know, uh, creatures they are and these little, um, you know, kind of micro um, um, surgeons. So why should we use it? Well, it gives rapid debridement in kind of one to eight days. The bag is applied so easy like a dressing, so it's easy to use. We just have to, you know, we, we kind of have to go and moist it, but we're not using it generally beyond a week, sometimes maybe, but not, not usually. Um, we've looked at what amazing thing it does and, you know, and so it's going to kick start that wound into healing. If it's like the diabetic foot and there's bone and tendon exposed, it's perfectly safe to use um, around that, reduces the odor and reduces the biofilm structures, you know, in 48 hours, which I think is, is actually pretty um, in, impressive. This is an article which um, I just put this in at the last minute because I saw it on LinkedIn and there's been a bit of media coverage around um, larvae at the minute and because of how good it is. And it's called, I like the, the, the title of it, Out for Blood. And it's talking about the, um, the, the, the larvae. It talks about the, uh, you know, the company down there in Wales and also leeches, which I'm not, not very familiar with using that, I have to say. And that's also in Swansea in Wales. So there you go. These kind of what people think of, oh, these are very ancient type of, of remedies and things but it just shows doesn't it how how good they are so if you get a chance to uh, to have a look at that then uh, yeah then then do i'm not sure which which uh, newspaper it was in so maybe we can Vicky can share that in the chat with you so wounds that are indicated for the larvae therapies we've got you know leg ulcers there we've got diabetic foot ulcers burns hematomas dehistological wounds traumatic wounds uh, you know, we've got so many, um, you know, that, that we can use use that, that, that it with. Any contraindications and precautions? Well, if wounds that tendency to bleed a lot, um, you know, close to a, a major blood vessel, patients on the anticoagulants um, and, uh, you know, wounds that are kind of the cavities are kind of near to um, organs. Um, so, you know, we have to do that whole uh, assessment of that. And if people have particular allergies from products within the, the dressing itself, you know, when they come in the bio bag. So we must adhere to best practice. That's you know we have consensus documents. We have best practice documents. This is the wound infection one, and it was updated recently in two thousand and twenty-two. Um, and there's so much information in there. Do download it. Uh, it's free to, to download, and it's got it will answer so many questions. You know, it's hard to cover everything that we have in the in the time we've got this evening. Um, and but yeah, it, that that is a, a, a go to, and it's got the infection continuum in there as well. And it actually tells you it's like it's got it's got an, it's got the the at the back of the document it's got the continuum in again, and it's giving us hints and tips of how to reduce the biofilm. And it, it's talking about you know it's there it says look perform therapeutic cleansing, debridement, um, you know, so it's got, it's, it's all, all covered in there. It also has in there this step up, step down biofilm based wound care um, process as well. So um, yeah, um, and on, you know, it, it, it really good. So um, yeah, go to it, just get it on Google and you can, you can download it, keep it on your, on your favorites, on your computer, or you obviously you can print a, a hard copy as well if you want to. Also within there, and it's important to mention we're talking about infection because people often say, well, what about swabbing a wound? When should we swab or, you know, we, we actually over swab wounds, to be honest. Um, you know, I mean, it is a low cost um, thing to do is a swab, but, you know, we do overdo it. And as I said, with all wounds, they are all contaminated. So when we do a swab and send it off, if we're not very specific on the, you know, what we want the lab to, to look at, um, you know, it's just going to come back. It will say, you know, um, you know, flora in there, 
a bacteria, you know, it, because we know it's, it's always going to be in. What the swabbing should do is indicate when we've got that kind of spreading infection, of the you know, type of, of antibiotics we want to, uh, to, to associate with it. But, you know, again, sometimes that can be a bit subjective. And so when, you know, they, we, we can do um, sampling, there's all sorts of ways to take um, a wound sample, but, you know, the swab is what probably we usually do. And when we do that, we need to cleanse the wound. We need to debride the wound. So we're not going in where devitalized tissue is or slough and exudate and getting all that on the wound swab. No, we need to go into a clean granulating area. And we moisten the swab tip. And it's um, it's called the, the Levine technique is the one of choice now, rather than we used to go Z like that, didn't we? The Z technique, the Levine technique. So you moisten the swab tip and you press that down into the wound. So you're getting some wound fluid that's kind of coming up and coming onto the swab um, and then you know we have to label it all correctly and everything else and say what it is we're trying to achieve and then we send that off to the lab and, and we'll see what results we get. Antimicrobial resistance we'll just touch on before I finish I'm just conscious of time and I know there's some questions coming in but you, you know we, we, we have we've got an overuse of antibiotics we've not had new antibiotics for many 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 years now um, and so, we, you know, we've, we've become largely very resistant. Now, we know at the minute we've heard in the media about kind of strep A with the kids and stuff. And, you know, it, it, it all becomes very complicated. And um, we've had COVID of how, you know, that bacterial um, becomes, uh, uh, um, you know, re uh, proliferant and we're, you know, resistant to, to what we have. So we have to be mindful with that in our wound care of giving it at the right time and when. And the antimicrobial um, stewardship, which is um, part of the World Health Organization initiatives. Um, and that's why we need to do our wound bed prep, um, you know, look at maybe non-medicated wound type dressings, our red flag pathways. Um, we need to stop the spread of the infection and we need to be thinking about prevention, you know, rather than reacting, um, um, reactive um, type of, of care. So points just to take away and reflect on in practice, just think of a couple of patients, you know, with, in, with hard to heal wounds. Does their plan of care need some evaluation? Have you developed aims and goals with the patient? Is there anything you can do differently? How do you currently cleanse and debride your wounds? You need some more education and support with that. Is there an infection prevention pathway in place? Is there an exudate pathway in place? Now, how are you treating your, you know, your lower limb wounds, compression? All these things all comes together. So we use the best practice evidence base to inform you know, what we're doing with everything. And there are people like me in your practice, the TVNs are specialist nurses, for you to go to, you know, your diabetic teams, you've got, you've, we've got our podiatrists here, we've so many, our MDT is very important and vital to us. We all need to come and, uh, and, and work together. So I think, I think we're just about kind of done for time there, Vicky. And um, I think there's some questions come through in the chat. I'll stop sharing my screen. Brilliant, thank yeah. you. <laughs> We will just pop my screen back up. But yes, we have got some great questions, I have to say. And I have to say oh. thank you for that chat. It was um, it was really, really interesting. And I particularly enjoyed um, you talking about comparing uh, the, the wound hygiene and the oral hygiene. So mm. that's going to stick with me for a little while, I think. Um, but yes, let me get up the questions. So um, the first one we've got is why do people with lymphedema slash lymphatic problems generally have more thick discharge on their wound do you think ah well yeah because obviously you've got um venous insufficiency there but you've got your lymphatic in i can't speak now <laughs> <laughs> as well so in and the, with the in the the lymph fluid is very rich in in protein um so you tend to get that that kind of then that viscosity kind of all adds in you know with the the slough um um um, and, and, and everything else so and it, it really does burn the skin because mm -hmm. of the protein element to it so so that you need to the and, and, and often people can get recurring cellulitis so you know um, a severe infection so the British Lymphology Society guidelines um, have some great hints tips and management for that 
and you know it might be that these people actually have a prophylytic type of antibiotic pathway for them because they've had you know and an, an, an just a, a you know cellulitis upon cellulitis so yeah that's why you need your, your compression management in there really Brilliant, thank you. Um, so the next question, I think this person's asking about what the best way to offload patients who are um, a podiatry patients, thinking about the biomechanics behind it. What's the, what's your advice there? Yeah, um, biomechanics is really interesting. If you look up um, any work by Amit Gethin, um, he's done so much work around biomechanics, really interesting um, professor. He's actually based in, uh, in Israel. I've, the privilege to listen to him speak live a few times and um, it is that offload and obviously people who are diabetic um, have we always have to consider that their risk of pressure damage or diabetic foot ulcers so you know whatever's available in your trust areas there are so many devices now for offloading feet whether that's within a boot formation or you know wedges there's booties to help prevent shear and friction there's so many things mm. pillows if you've nothing else available but they tend to shift about you can never find a pillow in a hospital ward if you need one can you to be honest so but yeah but offloading is vital and very very important looking at footwear that's when we come in you know with our diabetic uh, foot teams or our podiatry teams to uh, but look at what's available in your equipment store you probably have more in there than you think really yeah yeah okay so uh next one is a example of a patient might be a tricky one i don't know if you'll get the whole picture here but um this person's got a patient who's at risk of amputation he had a fempot bypass which was very successful um has a necrotic toe which will probably auto amputate uh, but the dorsum of the foot which has um a large ulcer has now um, got an eschar there and she's just wondering what what you would recommend with regards to dressings and and do you think antibiotic cover would be necessary Necessary as well yeah so um obviously they've yeah so they've had the the bypass which is good yeah. so they've probably got the, the revascularization on there that you need to start to kind of do that re if, if you're doing abpi or tbpi you know that that to ascertain what the arterial status is like now i've done that with patients who've had this and they've like amazing how oh gosh you know they're kind of they're, they're okay now so we can use elements of compression of things dorsum of the foot of course on top um, so ascertain what the arterial status is like now and then you know you need to be looking at that element of debridement if you can work with your specialist teams with that um, get a, a pathway in place um, you know the larvae brilliant for this type of thing you know rather than just putting things on and waiting for it to soften soften you know they're in there aren't they those little surgeons and they're going to tackle that so look at what options are available in your local kind of policies and, and formulae. Brilliant, thank you. Um, next up, we have got um, someone asking, uh, we've always, or rather saying, we've always been recommended not to use tap water on diabetic uh, feet. Um, but is that something that you think is standard or generally not? Yeah, not in not just my opinion, but, you know, there's, if you look at all the evidence, the research, like, you know, we always use evidence-based practice, tap water versus saline. I know what you're saying, because obviously that increased risk of infection and things, but it's a chronic wound, it, you know, it isn't going to do any harm. But if your local policies do say, well, use saline, then, you know, we go with that. That's absolutely fine. I remember working in in inner city areas where, you know, people had old boilers and things like that 20 odd years ago where you might not want to use the tap water there you know you have to consider your environment and where you are but generally you know it's okay look it up look at like the Cochrane reviews on on the use of tap water and just come to your conclusion yeah Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and next up, we've got an interesting question. Would you would like to know if you've used chlorosolve in place of larvae? I haven't. No. So <laughs> I, I can't comment on that. Have you? Is that what you're saying? Are you saying in the, yeah, the person there or somebody <laughs> in the audience who, who, who have? Um, no, I, I haven't. So I, I, I can't comment on that one, I'm afraid. But if you can share with us. Yeah, absolutely. Be interesting to hear. OK, this might be a question for me, actually, I think. Um, so where do clinicians get larvae from if they need to use it to treat patients? So um, it's classed as an unlicensed pharmaceutical in the UK, which means that you need to have a doctor or independent nurse prescriber 
Some supplementary prescribers can write it up, but that very much depends on local trust policy. And then just like any other prescription, it goes to pharmacy and then pharmacy will place an order with us. And as long as we receive that order by 2 p.m. Monday to Friday, you can have a next day delivery. Um, you don't have to have a next day delivery, but that's what generally most people um, do. But if you want to learn a little bit more about it or or come and find out some more, then, you know, I'll give you some details at the end of how to do that. Um, but anyway, next question, we've got how long can chronic wounds take to heal in non-diabetic patients and when should it be referred to uh, tissue mobility um, with blood test within normal limits? Oh, how long, how long is a piece of string? I mean, we're all, everybody's individual, aren't they? So you can't put a time limit on it, but it, it kind of, it, in some uh, papers, it's got evidence it's written down if a, a wound's sort of not, not healing within 30 days it's classed as you know chronic but these days we tend to go on a much quicker time scale and certainly with leg ulcers we now say um, you know if something's not showing signs of healing within two weeks um, then you know we class it as then a hard to heal wound and we need to be then putting things in, into place um what's another part of that question that I... uh no i think that was pretty much it yeah no when yeah, but, yeah. Just look at the risk factors, look at the, is it within two weeks showing any signs of that, that, that healing or not? And then, you know, jump on it. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, next question we've got is, I think this is very, in fact, to part of your presentation. What cleansers are used in the cleansing pads? In the cleansing? Oh, um, do they mean, oh, right. So I think they may be mean because you've got... Um, um, kind of monofilament debridement pads, which yes. don't, you use that with water. Um, some of, some cleansing pads have like with the the wipes ones and things. God, I don't know exactly. Some of them have like aloe vera in, so they're quite mm. smooth and soothing. And some of them um, have an element of like an antiseptic. You've got you know there's solutions that you can squirt on and leave on, and you know with the gauze and things, they're antiseptic. So um, yeah, they, they, obviously look at the product in the BNF or something like that and uh, on the package itself and it'll give you every element of, of what's in there. But they're, they're, they tend to be quite kind, you know, onto the skin, not, not harsh, yeah. not like kind of hippie scrub or anything like that. Sure, sure. Okay, um, next question or more of a sort of observation really. Uh, so in this person's experience, podiatrist for 15 years, he's seen many foot wounds, diabetic and not, which have Veruca type tissue slash callus around the wound. Oh, yes. Um, usually refers to dermatology, which helps massively. Um, is this something you've come across? Um, also feel with hard to heal wounds, we should be looking at maybe dermatological conditions or cancers, things like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying with MDT, you know, um, wound care, you know, we've always, we tend to sit in silos and we still do very much in dermatology and tissue viability. I've been doing a lot of work on a condition called hydrodenitis superativa, which has sat in dermatology forever. And now we're bringing it into the world of, you know, colliding those worlds with wound care. We need to do that. I think this person might be talking about either such dry skin that forms hyperkeratosis or papillomatosis, which forms these warped like little structures mm. to the skin, often on the lower limb or foot. Um, and you get that hyperkeratinization of because you know, that that kind of, um, it's like chronic edema that's gone wrong, you know, it, it moves along those stages, and then we're going into lymphedema, and it's almost like woody is the tissue, you get these little bumps like a white warts, and I think it's that. We should always consider dermatology, and if a wound is, I always think of it like some wounds, they look fruity, they're like overgranulated, but like, you know what I mean, like a raspberry, and they bleed a lot, or they might heal and then break down again, and they may be, you know, um, um, a, a cancerous so we need to if you, you're not sure and you just think mm, this isn't right refer people you know they need to have then that maybe a skin biopsy or something brilliant thank you um someone's asking can you repeat the name of the lower limb paper you recommended earlier 
Oh, what did I say? Oh, it was the was it the National Wound Care Strategy Program? Uh, again, it's this is you know it's a national thing in combination with the NHS. You can Google it. They've got the lower limb program. They've got the pressure ulcer, surgical wounds, loads and loads of documents there. But also, if you look at say under something like Wounds UK, you've got the best practice statements for venous leg ulcers. There's one for complexities. There's loads of stuff out there. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. And I think this is our last question. Um, uh, a patient scenario again. Had a patient had a fall and a skin tear um, repaired, leaving a hematoma under part of the wound. Uh, do you think it's safe to leave and let it self-absorb um, if there's no boggy feeling? I wouldn't. I would definitely that needs to come away. So think of that in terms of debridement. Again, the larvae in that really good will get rid of it yeah. because they can take time to, you know, to get that. It's just dead tissue. It's blood. You know, it's just sitting there. It will break down. You probably get infection. So I know what you mean. You're saying that it's kind of that spongy and boggy and, and uh, no, get get rid of it. Get it out. <laughs> And I have to say that the larvae do particularly enjoy a hematoma. So. They do. It's the blood. It must be the, 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 must the old blood. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's that's all our questions. Oh, sorry. Someone's asked one last very quick one. Okay. Can you repeat the name of the professor? Oh, um, yes. Amit Gethin. So that's A-M, I think it's I-T. Yes, it is I-T. And G-E-F. It's either E-N or I-N. He's told me off once before <laughs> when I said I put it in a paper and I, I spelt it wrong. But yeah, he's got stuff on that he's done online, loads of papers done. Um, yeah, it, it great work that, they, that, that he does. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I'll definitely be be checking that out. Yeah. yeah. Um, so thank you very much, Alison. That was a really, really interesting Pleasure. talk. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. And um, we are stopping for a Christmas break, but we will be back in the new year with some more exciting guests and and some uh, webinars for you. So do keep an eye on our website at biomon.com forward slash biomon live and you will see all of the new dates coming up in the new year and you can register there. Um, if in the meantime you want to learn some more, there's a couple of different things you can do. So you can head over to our website and look at Biomon Now, which is our short videos. We've got our previous webinars that we've recorded and put on there. Um, there's lots of sort of behind the scenes as well. We've also got our academy, which um, you, if you've been around a while, you might have heard of Larval Academy. And this is uh, the same thing. It's just been refreshed and rebranded. It's all uh, brand new. So you can find that on our website and it's a um, module based learning platform. And you do get a certificate at the end of each platform as well. And if you like, I can come and do some presentations for you over Teams or Zoom. You can book me through our Biomon Direct system and that shows you all of my availability and you can pick how long you'd like me to talk for as well merry um, christmas everybody yeah absolutely <laughs> <Say that. laughs> have a wonderful have a christmas everyone um if you have any questions after today you want to ask myself or alison pop them through uh, on our helpline or on our um, email and don't forget we are on social media and uh, i'm sure you are too so do come and follow us on one of your favorite platforms um but as alison said have a lovely christmas and thank you ever so much for joining us on a particularly poignant day and hopefully we'll see you all again for the next one see you later